how will we live on the moon in say 10 years from now? How will we transport ourselves on, Mar in, on Mars say 20 years from now? Uh, so it's not exactly science fiction. It's, it's kind of real and it's for the future, but not the far future. It's for the near future. Welcome to the Anahita Speaker Series presented by Carnegie India, celebrating stirring stories of women who lead and inspire. I am Kanika Monga, Communications and Strategy Advisor at Carnegie India, and today I will be speaking to Dr. Susmita Mohanty, a space entrepreneur, climate advocate, celebrity speaker, thought leader, and interdisciplinary expert. We are privileged to have with us Dr. Mohanty. Thanks, Kanika. Happy to be here. Uh, I think what I'll do is I will walk you through my life's journey in a way that will give you a sense of how it all began, uh, what were the early influences growing up, and why did I choose to become a spaceship designer in the first place? Growing up, I think what was um, uh, critical um, in the way I grew up is it was a very, very gender neutral upbringing. And I was amongst uh, the early space pioneers. Uh, you could say Sarabhai, Vikram Sarabhai was starting to recruit in, in the late 60s when my dad returned from Germany. So he was one of the first recruits. Um, back then there was no ISRO, the Indian Space Research Organization was incorporated, I think in 1971 or two. So all of the young engineers who Sarabhai hired in the, in the first instance, they were hired into the Atomic Energy Commission uh, and then ISRO was formed. So I grew up among the space pioneers, my dad being one of them. And the pioneers are always different from the people who run the agency today. They are, I would, I would call them more as bureaucrats. Uh, so very humble beginnings. And now India has reached a stage where it can easily be ranked among the top six spacefaring countries, not only in terms of technological capabilities, but also in terms of the budget. On the right hand side, you see a beautiful TV grab of the first, well, one of the Apollo landings. I think it was the 1969 landing probably. Um, so I grew up with these images and stories of um, fledgling space programs of different countries and people associated with them. And back then, there was a lot of friendship and camaraderie among scientists around the world. So the Indian scientist, for example, Professor Yashpal, who was one of my mentors, he was friends with Philip Morrison, with Stephen Hawking. Um, the world was very different back then, let's put it that way. And I also, have to attribute some of my early influences to the fact that I was raised in Ahmedabad in Gujarat uh, and Ahmedabad as we all know is home to very many cotton mill owner families so industrial families wealthy families who not only invited uh, contemporary architects to build their private residences but also public buildings so I grew up amongst patrons of architecture and architects so if you put architecture uh, and space together, juxtapose them, what you have is space architecture. And that's what became my early passion. We see that youngsters, you know, see these as two different fields completely. So they either go into like a creative field, like fashion designing or, you know, anything like that, and or they go into academics. Uh, so it's really interesting how you, you know, uh, created a marriage between the two. Yes, no, I, I think Kanika, what's, uh, what's important is how we approach education, uh, both at home and in our schools. It's very important for parents uh, and our teachers to inculcate the love of doing things, you know, which engages both our right brain and left brain. Uh, it's, 
it's really, I mean, if you think about life, we don't separate the way our brain works when, when we live, right? There are creative aspects to living life and uh, more practical aspects to living life. So I encourage children or young people to try and bridge these two worlds because the joy of doing not only, you know, hardcore technical problem solving, um, there is no reason why solving a technical problem doesn't need creativity, right? It, it needs both. Uh, so on one hand, I can work with an engineer to design, let's say the systems aspects of a space habitat, which is very exciting. I can also equally well collaborate with an architect who uh, will take a look at human factors in, in a far more interesting manner than an engineer. Let me give you an example. If you're designing a window on a, on, a, on a space module, an engineer will tell you, oh, we shouldn't have too many windows because you know the window is one of the most vulnerable parts on the skin of the space habitat. And the designer, even the astronaut, uh, the architect will say, no, we should have a few more windows because it helps boost um, you know, it, give, it sort of gives you a mental boost because you're connecting better with the outside. Psychologically, it just helps you as an astronaut to be happier, more productive during your stay in a confined can for long periods of time. So I think this balance between the physiological, the physical, the psychological becomes possible when you merge disciplines. And I think the world we live in now is even more conducive to multidisciplinary collaboration. You know, there was no such discipline as space architecture, but I, I decided that's what I want to do. You know, I want to go out and design things for living, uh, living in extraterrestrial environments. The reason I found that exciting is because when you design for living in outer space, remember we are living on a spaceship ourselves, a blue spaceship, which is hurtling through space at enormous speeds. Uh, so we are already in space. But when we design for environments other than our home planet, where we are conditioned, you know, there's gravity, there's atmospheric pressure, there's natural illumination, there are all these gamut of colors that we are accustomed to. Uh, all of this cannot be taken for granted if you are, let's say, on, on Moon or on Mars or some other celestial body. And that's what makes it very exciting for me as a designer. Since there was no such thing as space architecture in, in you know, when I was in high school, I used to come up with imaginary problems of living and working in microgravity or variable gravity environments and try and solve them. So I was lucky to be in a place where within a you know, five to eight kilometer radius, I could access some of the most amazing institutions uh, not just in India, in the world. Uh, we had Space Application Center, we had the Physical Research Laboratory, we had the School of Architecture, we had the National Institute of Design, the Indian Institute of Management, the Textile Research Association. So a whole bunch of fantastic institutes and beautiful libraries. And given that I was this extroverted kid who was always looking to work on ideas, I could just bicycle over to these libraries. I would seek out interesting people in these institutes to talk to and try and work on my design problems. I did my undergrad in engineering. Uh, I thought it was a good idea to have an engineering foundation. And then I chose to go to the National Institute of Design, which is also in Ahmedabad, one of the finest design institutes in the world. Uh, after that, I um, went to the International Space University in Strasbourg in France. Uh, not so much for another master's, but to be able to become part of this worldwide community of young people who are passionate about space. And my studies at the Space University were funded, uh, my tuition was funded by the science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, that's quite a story how all that happened, but I won't go into excruciating detail, but essentially I had to raise $35,000 to be able to attend the Space University. And that had to be done in eight months uh, without the internet, mind you. So I reached out to seven different individuals around the world, including Arthur Clarke, Carl Sagan, Bill Gates, and a couple of others. I wrote to 70 different foundations. I approached the United Nations in nine different ways. 
And I heard back from some of them, including Arthur Clark, who was uh, very generously offered to pay my tuition. Uh, some of my friends in the United States did a Kickstarter before Kickstarter and raised money for my living expenses. So here I was all set to fly to France and study at the Space University. Towards the end of the university master's program, I went to NASA Johnson. Uh, back then, security was not a big issue as it is now. Um, and after 9-11, of course, all of that changed. So back then, it was a wonderful, wonderful world that we all inhabited. I was at NASA, um, badged for access to every single building on site, which is impossible in today's scenario. Um, so not only did I get to work on some very interesting design projects for uh, the new International Space Station that was being designed, uh, also for shuttle Mir missions. So the Russians and Americans were cooperating, whereby you can see in this picture, the space shuttle Atlantis, the American space shuttle Atlantis docked with the Mir space station in space. And you're looking at Atlantis from one of the big, beautiful windows on the Russian station. I worked on shuttle Mir mission projects. I was a test subject for very many tests that were happening uh, at Johnson. Um, you know, for example, uh, they were trying to figure out if women or men are more efficient in docking stations in, in space. And they found that, well, gender really doesn't, is not an issue. They are both equally good in docking stations. You know, you had this, uh, you know, um, environment, I would say, where you were encouraged by a lot of people in the field of space. And, um, you know, you worked really hard to get the mentors that you did. Um, how, how does one get that, you know, that go-getter uh, approach and, you know, really find those opportunities? Yes, no, I think that's a very good question. I mean, I was not the only uh, kid growing up around these space guys and architects. There were many others, but they didn't choose to do what I did. Um, I think it's it's a, it's it's multiple things. I think as a kid, uh, even as an adult, uh, I've always been very curious, and I like going into the unknown. You know, I like things where you don't know what is behind the door. Uh, a lot of people are very uncomfortable uh, dealing with risk or the unknown. You know, even the pandemic is a great example of living in uncertain times. So I think individual, as an individual, as a person, I never had fear of anything, like literally nothing, which is what my mom used to keep pointing out, oh, this girl. But I think, I think lack of fearlessness in one way, curiosity in another way, and also wanting to sort of seek out the unusual, whether it's people or ideas, right? So I, even to this day, you can just put me anywhere in the world and I will find very many interesting people around me. I'll go and seek them out. So I started my first sort of officially, my first uh, job at Boeing in Huntington Beach in Orange County in Southern California. Uh, I worked for the International Space Station program at Boeing and this was actually in some ways an inflection point. The reason I say that is here I was trained as a designer, an engineer, a problem solver um, and because I was a foreign national and they could not give me access to drawings and the intranet, I was hired to work in international business development. So I ended up being part of a small team of 12 people at the space station program office in Boeing, where we were the only ones making money for the program. Everybody else was busy spending it. I learned how to write proposals, you know, where you bid for contracts, international contracts with the with partners uh, on the space station program. So we would bid for contracts with the Japanese, the French, the Germans, what have you. Um, we had to negotiate contracts and also manage them. So that kind of learning experience was amazing because it, it was sort of an add-on layer to what I already did as a designer and engineer. So I learned the business side of things, right? Uh, which I think is very, very important if uh, anybody wants to go out and start his or own company. Uh, I left Boeing in 2000 after three years of working for their international business development office and decided that I wanted to start my own company.
A lot of people ask, why does India even have a space program? Well, having satellites or the capability to launch them and use them is not exactly a luxury. It's a necessity for a subcontinent like India because satellites allow you to do so many different things. Everything from telecommunications to taking pictures of the earth, we call it remote sensing and global positioning. And, you know, space is a part of uh, everybody's lives your life, my life, the fisherman, the farmer, uh, the truck driver, because we are all using space technology in one way or the other, or a combination of it without even actually realizing that we are. I moved back to India in 2008. Um, and after I moved back, um, I sort of tried to get a sense of the Indian space landscape. You remember, I grew up with the Indian space program starting out in the early 70s. So I had seen the program evolve over the years. Um, and I had a fair sense of where things were, but I went out and met people at ISRO. So I went to Trivandrum and I met the team that was working on the human space program for India. Remember, we are now um, planning, as in India is planning to launch humans into low Earth orbit on a spacecraft called Gaganyaan a couple of years from now. Any country that uh, pursues human exploration usually needs about a good 10 years to get there or even more. So when I arrived in India, they had already started working on the human space program. They had already tested a crew capsule for re-entry technologies. Uh, it was wonderful to meet that team of scientists in Trivandrum. Uh, so they shared with me what they were working on and I shared with them the kind of projects I had done in the past 10 years. Uh, it was an exchange of ideas, um, fairly, uh, you know, a fun way of kind of seeing where they are headed and maybe if I could help. first seven years, we decided our mission will be to make one of the Indian rockets, we have two rockets, the PSLV and the GSLV, to make the PSLV, which is a rocket that is used for launching Earth observation satellites, one. Uh, one of the most sought after rockets in its class. So while India has a most amazing, a very accomplished space program, India barely plays a role in the international space market. Annually, as of today, as of now, the global space revenues for civilian space, not defense, just peaceful utilization of space, that market is nearly 400 billion US dollars. And India barely has a role in it. So when I moved back, I decided that I would leverage my experience living abroad, working with the Americans, the Europeans, and the Japanese, and, and the others, to try and help India make forays into this Indi international marketplace. There's just one last question that I would like to end with. Uh, so, you know, this is on space exploration and space tourism, and it also connects to like the space think tanks. So what, what is your opinion on the research Richard Branson and the Jeff Bezos? And what do you think their, their, uh, their aim is when they're doing this? Is it colonization? Is uh, it I think that's a, that's a provocative question and a good one. So I, I just recently wrote an opinion piece on the billionaire space race uh, for an Australian magazine. So those of you listening in, you could Google uh, this opinion piece in a magazine called The Brilliant. And it's the title of the opinion piece is um, uh, why, uh, well, billionaires playing space ping pong, uh, leave me cold. Uh, so, so I'm not very excited about Bezos or Branson going to space, to be honest, and especially the way they're doing it. Um, so space tourism, I don't think uh, I'm opposed to the idea of private space flight. I think it's, you know, what happened to commercial aviation in the last century will happen to private space flight in this century. But 
it is important how we approach it. You know, now we live in a, a, a we live in a time where climate change is become extreme. Uh, so if uh, a billionaire claims to be an eco entrepreneur, he or she needs to go the extra mile to ensure that these flights are as green as they possibly can be. Right. And I, I personally think this whole idea of casual space tourism uh, is not going to be uh, very good for our uh, near Earth environment. You know, we already have a very big problem with man made debris in low Earth orbit. We have millions of man made debris objects orbiting the Earth as we speak, and we don't have any enforceable laws. So I'm slowly becoming a space environmentalist, if you ask me. Um, I, I, I am now part of you know, the international, a uh, growing international group of people who are starting to lobby, to work towards having governments and space agencies come up with laws which forces the Bransons and Bezos and the Musks of the world to, let me give you another example. I mean, casual space tourism is, is one, but the other one is um, we have companies launching constellations of satellites, right? So Elon Musk, for example, is launching Starlink, which is more than 40,000 satellites. Uh, what happens with these satellites that are launched in low Earth orbit, they die very quickly in a couple of years because there's atmospheric drag, they're not far out enough. So I think, if you ask me, if I if, if someone puts out 40,000 satellites in low Earth orbit, it is a bit of a land grab. You know, for me, it's colonization 2.0 because there are no laws to prevent a private entity or individual to take over a shared commons like outer space. Uh, he's able to do that. Um, so I, I think I think there are a lot of very, very concerning issues when it comes to near earth pollution, it's already happening or, or Musk throwing his red roadster up in space. I mean, why should a billionaire be allowed to throw up personal effects in the cosmic commons? Um, one, he shouldn't be allowed to and two, he should pay for it if he's doing that. So I think a lot of things need to be reined in. And for that, we need to have people like me and others um, to, to push for change. Otherwise, what's what we've done to our home planet, we're already doing it to near Earth space and we'll be trashing it. We'll be trashing any future planet that we go to if we don't have um, enforceable environmental laws, so to speak. So we'll repeat the same mistakes yet again if we don't uh, hold ourselves responsible. After the first seven years, Earth to Orbit decided that we wanted to do something about climate change uh, because, you know, anthropogenic climate change or climate change caused by human activities is now becoming a very serious problem. As you can see around you, the climate spikes that we are experiencing year after year are just getting worse, whether it's a cyclone or a forest fire or earthquakes. Um, so the way we approached um, so we thought, okay, what is it that we can do to create actionable intelligence uh, using satellite imagery? Um, so we chose to focus on two areas. One was agriculture and the other one was smart cities. Um, so what the, the idea here was to try and use open source satellite data from a fantastic new constellation that's been launched by Europe. It's called Sentinel and create models not only using satellite imagery, but also ancillary data, relevant data um, that's relevant to the problem you're trying to solve. So one of the models we built was how to forecast what kind of acreage or yield you will have for the Kharif season, how much rice will the country produce or the state produce. Um, we also developed a couple of models for cities to make them climate smart. Like I can look at a neighborhood in Bangalore and tell you um, which rooftops are best suited for harvesting solar energy. Um, or how do you manage the water infrastructure of a city like Bangalore? Or how do you plan the next outer ring road? Uh, and, uh, or how do you prevent sprawl? So I think the beauty of satellites is you can quite literally use satellite data uh, with other kinds of data, of course, uh, and leverage the advances made in machine learning and AI, artificial intelligence, to solve real world problems. There are several other 
things um, that I've done in these past 20 years, uh, some of them have been fairly uh, transformative, even mind bending in some ways. And one of those things is traveling to the polar regions. So I was invited to go to the Arctic by the Swedish Space Physics Institute, which is in Kiruna in the Swedish Arctic. That was in 2009. And more recently, in 2017, I was invited to be part of the first cultural expedition to Antarctica. Usually the expeditions to Antarctica are scientific in nature. This was the first cultural expedition. So I traveled to Antarctica with uh, almost 40 artists from around the world and eight interdisciplinary experts like myself. Uh, we also had divers, we had a philosopher, we had filmmakers. It was an eclectic crew, and we sailed to Antarctica, spent two weeks, um, not only exploring the icy continent, um, the artists had also created uh, artworks, which uh, if you go to the Antarctic Biennale website, you'll have an idea of what kind of artworks. Um, but I think the most um, important takeaway um, for me from this expedition was that while we are all aware that climate change is here and it's it's becoming very, very problematic, um, by being in an extreme environment like Antarctica, um, you cannot but be moved by what you see. You know, we were sitting in, uh, on, on during one of our landings, we were sitting quietly in, in this place called Paradise Bay and you could hear these loud explosions and it, it sounded as if a skyscraper was being detonated. Antarctica is made up of ice shelves. So a large chunk of ice had broken away from one of the ice shelves. And that sound was actually that of an iceberg calving, right? And breaking away. And that it was, it was just amazing to hear the, the kind of disaster that we humans have brought upon our home planet. Uh, and of course, I have seen similar things on other expeditions too, you know, whether I'm hiking in the Alps um, or if we are out in the cities, if you look at the rising temperatures everywhere. Um, I think the people most impacted are the farmers, the daily laborers, um, refugees, uh, people who are living in coastal uh, cities and villages around the world because the temperatures are rising, the ocean levels are rising, glaciers are melting way. So if you ask me, um, we are now reaching a point. In fact, I, I personally, if I look at everything that's happened in the last 10, 15, 20 years, climate wise, I think things have reached a point when they are not very reversible anymore. Uh, for example, if all of Antarctica were to melt, the ocean uh, levels were, would rise by the equivalent of a 20 story building. A lot of the big cities will be underwater, whether it's San Francisco or Mumbai or uh, you know, any of the cities that are on the coast will go underwater. So it's real and it is terrifying and it is something we all need to be aware of. So I think we need that kind of planetary consciousness, which I try to inculcate, especially in the younger generation, uh, the millennials and the Gen Zs. I want them to take the planet back because the planet is in real trouble. And if things go the way they are, I would say in three to four generations, maybe in about 50, 60 years, the earth will not be very habitable anymore. Um, I think with that, I will um, wrap up my story of all the different things that I've been doing for the past 20 years and hand it back to you, Kanika. That was wonderful, Dr. Mohanty. Thank you so much for your time and for being with us today. Your experiences as a space entrepreneur and a climate advocate serve as insightful life lessons for young professionals. To our audiences, thank you so much for being here and we hope you enjoyed the new avatar of the Anayata Speaker Series. We hope you found this talk as thought-provoking as we did. Do subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on social media for more exciting content. <laughs>